boa noite a todos. Meu nome é Gabriela, eu faço parte da atual gestão do Centro Acadêmico Guimarães Rosa. Nós estamos aqui hoje para o evento de fechamento de uma série de três encontros promovidos pelo Guima durante o mês de maio como parte de um projeto chamado Maio Cultural. Esse ano o tema escolhido para o maio foi o Oriente Médio, com enfoque nas decorrências da Primavera Árabe. Então, hoje o nosso foco é o Iêmen. E para isso nós convidamos o professor Karabeki, professor visitante aqui do IRI, responsável pela matéria, de, pela matéria As Arreis do Oriente Médio. Uma tradução livre do, do Pauli. <risos> é, agora eu vou deixar o professor se apresentar da forma como ele preferir. Um, I'll speak English. Is that okay for everyone? Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, thank you, Gabriela, and thank you, Paulo, for inviting me to uh, give this lecture. It's a pleasure to meet more of you guys and to talk about um, um, a far away for you corner of the world, um, closer to my um, you know, neck of the woods, and to sort of realize that not everything is so uh, foreign and alien. Actually, there are a lot of commonalities um, between the Middle East, Latin America. A lot of the themes are quite common. Um, except, I would say, I would even put one um, uh, asterisk, asterisk and say that one of the most complicated cases um, in the entire sort of Middle East region to unpack and talk about, I find, is Yemen. So when I accepted to uh, come to this uh, talk, I also even hesitated because it is, um, of all the sort of regions and countries uh, within the region that I deal with, Yemen is the one that challenges me the most. So what is going to happen is probably I'm going to really confuse you for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> okay? You're going to be very confused. Um, and hopefully after that, we will actually turn that confusion into knowledge with questions and answers. So um, let me begin you know, with that disclaimer. Okay? And if you at any point have a question clarification question not, uh, that you would like to sort of have an answer for right away, do not hesitate to raise your hand. But if you could save the more sort of discussion related questions to the end, I'd appreciate it, okay? And I'm going to stand up so that I can warm up a little bit in this, in this cold <laughs> room. Do you think I should use this? Okay, um, what do we know about Yemen? What do you know about Yemen? What have you heard about it? What is, what comes through your mind when you hear Yemen? If you're silent because you don't want to, you know, you're, 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 you're shy to speak out, I understand, but if you're silent because you don't know much, I also understand. To be honest, if I asked you the same question about Syria or Iraq, you would probably have a few more things to say more, more easily. Because those countries have been on the news um, frequently all over the world for a long time. Yemen hasn't. But that doesn't mean that what's happening in Yemen isn't relevant and isn't worthy of our urgent attention. In fact, what I'm going to talk about will probably show you that it's um, even more urgent than some of the more traditional conflicts that we are more used to talking about in the Middle East, such as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which changes um, much less uh, quickly, and, um, or, or even the Syrian conflict, which has sort of uh, uh, gone to a, a, a sort of military stalemate. But Yemen is very intense, and um, somehow it hasn't captured the international attention. And I'm going to try to answer that as well. A few Quick facts, Yemen, and part of the answer perhaps to why we haven't seen it on the news as much, is the fact that this is a country that has the unfortunate reputation of being the poorest nation in the Middle East. It has you know, oil reserves, but much less compared to its northern neighbor, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, or other uh, Gulf monarchies, which also makes it less of an interest to geopolitical calculations and therefore, again, less of an interest to uh, international news and media. Okay? Um, but despite this poverty, um, it is extremely rich in 
culture and history. In fact, it is one of the oldest um, countries, one of the oldest political entities in the Arab world. What do I mean by that? Yemen has had self-government, um, autonomous or independent self-government for centuries. They've been very um, uh, proudly independent, oftentimes pushing back um, occupiers, invaders, be they the Ottomans or the British or later um, the Saudi family coming in and trying to control. Um, and they've been a very sort of fiercely um, uh, independent people, but they've also been very divided internally. It's an extremely rich cult uh, 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 culture and history, um, and, and also um, it's actually, this is, this is um, reflected on the, um, the landscape of the country itself. Sana'a, the capital of Yemen, is one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. So when you look at, you know, when you think about the Arab world, uh, you think about countries like uh, Qatar, you think about countries like Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. These are relatively new political entities, okay? That doesn't mean that there wasn't anything there before. I mean, Saudi Arabia has two of Islam's holiest cities, but political authority based in these cities was um, shorter, or at least more transient. Um, and its sort of cultural legacy, um, perhaps more shallow. Whereas in the case of Yemen, there is um, a, a very significant cultural legacy. Sana'a, as I said, one of the oldest continuously settled cities in the world, and uh, if the old citadel, the old city, is a UNESCO cultural heritage site, which, since 2015, has been uh, going through a devastating civil conflict that is creating utter tragedy for the Yemeni population and threatening this cultural heritage. The picture is from the old city of Yemen and the destruction of these centuries-old, very typical Yemeni architecture buildings um, have been taking place in front of you know, uh, the eyes of the international community, and nothing is happening on top of that. Okay, let me start with a very brief history. I told you that the Yemenis um, are uh, fiercely independent and have fought back um, invaders since centuries. These are generally, we're talking about a tribal society. So there are allegiances to different tribes, allegiances to different regions. Um, but when they come together, you know, they fight against, and oftentimes the tribes come together to uh, fight against the um, you know, foreign invader. And in the case of um, the medieval uh, example of this, in the Ottoman, in the, in the 1500s, there was the episode of the Ottoman Turkish, Ottoman Imperial um, occupation of Yemen, which only lasted about 100 years. They were thrown back, in a sense, literally by the 1600s. And until about um, the early or middle 19th century, Yemen maintained its sort of autonomous or independent um, uh, rule. In, 19, in 1839, the British expanding its empire, came to control a strategic port city called Aden. It's actually, let me show you, right here. Can you, can you go back to the map? Yeah. So just to point out, Yemen, where it's located, it's in the south tip of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, it is strategic in the sense that it is the port or the opening of uh, the Red Sea. And we can go back now. Red Sea became an important strategic route, transport route, with the opening of the Suez Canal in the 19th century. The Suez Canal, in turn, is, does anyone know where the Suez Canal is? It is the canal that connects Egypt, I mean, sorry, it's in Egypt, yes, in Suez, it connects the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. And what happens is that ships can pass through the Suez Canal, go to the Red Sea, and go to India. That opens a pathway for, back in the day, British colonial ships 
to uh, access Asia, especially its colonies in India. It's very, very important. If that didn't happen, they would have to certain, go under um, south of uh, Africa from the Horn of, uh, Horn of Cape of Good Horn, Hope, and it would prolong the journey um, extensively. So this, is a, this becomes a strategic asset for the British Empire, and they keep not a hold of entire Yemen in any way, but the port city of Aden and the area around it. Okay, and they stay there until 1967. Okay? In 1918, in the meanwhile, the Ottomans come back. In the late 19th century, early 20th century, the Ottomans come back and establish a sort of protectorate over Yemen. The Ottoman Empire collapses with World War I. One of the big defeats is also in Yemen. Um, I'm from Turkey, and um, I, we still remember uh, sort of nostalgic songs that have passed down from generation to generation of Ottoman soldiers going and dying in Yemen. Um, because this was seen to be a lost cause, a faraway land, and the young boys being sent for whatever cause and, and not returning. In 1918, with the end of the First World War, um, Yemen, a portion of Yemen in the north, northwest, gains independence and is ruled by a, a, a religious political family. A ruler is called Imam Yahya. This is actually a Shia family, but supported by um, a vast uh, coalition of tribal networks. But the North Yemeni, or the Yemeni uh, imamates, as it's called, influence doesn't expand beyond this uh, north area. Um, in 1962, this, there's a change of government. It's actually the, the, the uh, leadership is passed on from the father to the son of the same family. But there's a military coup. A military coup in the capital Sana'a, which removes uh, the uh, the, the, the leader and declares a republic. At this point in the south of Yemen, in the 60s, there's a strong socialist movement brewing. Socialist republican movement, which is backed by Egypt. Egypt at the time, in 1950s and 1960s, is under a charismatic um, Arab socialist leader called Gamal Abdel Nasser. Nasser wants Arabian unity, under a secular republican uh, ideology, which we call Arab socialism. Egypt sends forces to Yemen. Saudi Arabia at the time, now becoming sort of like a big player in the region, sends forces to defend the imamate, the sort of religious political authority in North Yemen. And the first Yemeni civil war starts from 1962 to 1970. Okay. This is often referred to as Egypt's Vietnam because Egypt gets more and more dogged and clogged into this conflict, has to send more and more uh, enemies, but the sort of stalemate doesn't change. However, it's actually also a fairly successful war effort because the republic is then established. North Yemen becomes a republic. Okay? In 1970, a ceasefire is, is reached between the two Yemens, the sort of socialist Yemen in the south and the um, uh, um, Egyptian-backed Socialist Republic in the south and the Saudi-backed Royalists in the north. And there are two Yemens that are um, established. Both of them are republics, but they represent different uh, tribal and geopolitical um, uh, coalitions. In the north, northwest, as you see on uh, that orange bit of the map, is the north is North Yemen or Yemen Arab Republic. And in the south is the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen. This People's Democratic Republic turns also then in, 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 the, in the following years has several episodes of internal conflict. Um, and during the 1970s, there are internal coups and there's a Soviet-backed faction which comes to power and declares this a communist state. It is the only open communist state um, with a direct link to the Soviet Union in the Middle East, in the Arab world. 
So in a sense, what we today see is Yemen, sort of this backward, um, uh, a religiously divided um, sectarian conflict, poorest nation in the Middle East, happen to have the most sort of secular, the most um, materialistic, non-religious um, drive for regime change in the Middle East. And, um, and, and, and this, this, is where, this was in South Yemen at the time. In 1978, a man called Ali Abdullah Saleh, whose name we then hear a lot, becomes the president of the North. He's backed by the Saudis. Okay? And finally, after much conflict and um, tension between and within these two entities in 1990, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, of course, facilitated, the two Yemens are reunited. And there is now a single Yemeni Republic, which we now know. Okay? The power sharing agreement is um, um, a, a power sharing agreement is signed. The president of the North Saleh becomes the president of the Republic, and the president of the Southern Yemeni Republic becomes the vice president. The tensions, however, do not go away, and after the 1990s, there are skirmishes and conflicts going on in uh, within this unified Yemen. In this sense, as you can see, already in the 1960s and the 1990s, Yemen is reflecting um, regional or global dynamics in its uh, local politics. In the 1960s, it's the um, competition between conservative Gulf Arab monarchies led by Saudi Arabia on the one hand and the Arab Socialist Republics led by Egypt on the other hand. In the 1990s, the end of the Cold War has a direct impact again on Yemen. And now when we come to the 2000s, it's another one of those waves. It's the post-September 11 uh, US war on terror era. In the south of Yemen, which is a sort of, uh, this is, a, by the way, a, a massive country where central governments have not traditionally controlled the entire territory. Okay, this is both true for domestic um, control, but also for uh, control of the border. It's actually considered one of the longest, if not the longest, um, unmarked borders in the world, the one between Yemen and Saudi Arabia. It's basically a vast desert area and mountains, and the, where the border is is actually quite um, um, uh, ambiguous. So in the 2000s, in one of these, in some of these sort of less controlled areas, the famous Al-Qaeda starts growing and starts attacking the uh, central government, which is supported by Saudi Arabia. Al-Qaeda's first uh, targets in the um, uh, Middle East were also Saudi and uh, Saudi government um, uh, uh, interests and Saudi proxies. Basically, Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden's idea was that the Saudi government was selling out Islam by allying itself with the United States, okay? So during the 2000s, Yemen comes back on uh, the map by with, these, uh, with, the, with the presence of Al-Qaeda and the US effort to sort of stop um, this, uh, this development. At the same time, from 2009 to 2000, 2004 to 2009, 2010, the Shia group, which are called Houthis, which you'll hear more about, in the north, traditionally in the north of the country, um, start an insurgency, an uprising against the rule of Ali Abdullah Saleh, who becomes more and more of a dictator, supported by Saudi money, supported by Saudi arms. This is not a sectarian uprising. Saleh himself is a Houthi, or at least he is uh, not a Houthi, but he is also of Shia background. And one of the messages I want to um, bring up and carry along the entire lecture is the fact that Sectarian divisions do not explain the dynamics in, in Yemen, but I'll get to that, okay? There is, at the same time, an uprising of the Houthis against the central government. They demand more rights, they demand reforms, okay? This is now increasingly seen as a sectarian conflict, I'll get to that. At the same time, Al-Qaeda attacks are happening, and then comes 2011, where the entire region is swept by fire of revolution and existing societal uh, discontents and um, 
uh, complaints resurface and pour out in Yemen as well. Millions of people, Yemenis, pour out to the streets and demand a change of government and change of um, uh, politics. Ali Abdullah Saleh is removed from power. The Saudis engage in a neg negotiation of a, a, a transition uh, government and a new unity government uh, that includes, again, a Saudi-backed president uh, called Hadi. Okay. So this is where we were until 2015, blasted onto um, the Yemeni uh, sort of um, current history. 2011, a new government is formed, uh, a sort of Saudi-backed um, unity government, but none of the actual underlying um, complaints or discontents are addressed. So it's basically, um, uh, picture hasn't really changed, and the, the, the societal tensions continue to brew. In 2015, what happens is, on the surface, and how we are described, how we, how we see it on the news, is a sectarian conflict. Sectarian conflict erupting, right? On the surface, the Saudi and UAE, United Arab Emirates, backed um, Sunni forces loyal to President Hadi, are fighting against now Iranian-backed Shia forces, the Houthi rebels, Houthi militias, who in September 2014 capture militarily the capital city of Sana'a and, and, and topple the government. In early 2015, the Saudis create a, 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 a coalition, mostly of uh, their um, uh, traditional allies uh, in the Gulf, to create, to, to launch a counteroffensive in order to retake the capital and suppress the Houthi uprising. Okay, so who are the Houthis? I'll get to that in a sense, in, in a minute. But these are actually, um, it's a, it's a nationalist sort of uh, they call it independence movement or in, a nationalist um, uh, um, political movement based on the Shia Zaidi um, portion of the Yemeni society. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why this is uh, the conflict post-2015 is framed as a sectarian conflict. Their concentration of population, I think I've already gone over my time limit, but I'll go over a little bit more. They happen to be in the northwest of, uh, of the country. Remember North Yemen, the Yemeni Republic in, in the north? This is basically their, um, that was, it was the Houthis, or the, the, the um, Zaydis as they're called, who constituted the, the population of North Yemen, who back then was backed by Saudi Arabia. And the south um, stretch of the country is more predominantly Sunni. So the idea is that this is a sectarian war, the um, Shias have risen up and take, uh, uh, toppled uh, uh, the uh, Saudi-backed government, and they're backed by Iran, and this is uh, the beginning of the conflict in 2015. Before I get to the dynamics of that conflict, let me give you the, the, the emergent, why we care about it, and what that conflict has quickly led to after 2015. Today we, Often, I mean, experts often refer to it, experts and, and, and sort of independent observers of Yemen often refer to it as the world's largest humanitarian catastrophe. World's largest humanitarian catastrophe that is not caused by any environmental or natural cause. It's a purely political and, and geopolitical crisis, conflict and atrocity, okay? Um, which involves indiscriminate bombing of civilian targets, by Saudi and UAE um, military uh, forces, including hospitals, schools, weddings, funerals, and agricultural land. It has a, a, a new estimate in, at the end of 2018 uh, suggested that between 2015 and until then, in the three years that passed, up to 60,000 people had died. 60,000 people had died in this conflict. Millions of people have been displaced. This number doesn't include, very importantly, the number of people 
including children, who are thought to have perished because of malnutrition and starvation. Up to 85,000 children have perished because of starvation. And some 14 million people are considered on the brink of uh, uh, hunger famine. Therefore, this is considered the world's largest humanitarian catastrophe. It's not just the bombing that is causing this, but also the blockade that the Saudis are imposing on uh, strategic ports uh, where humanitarian aid would be delivered. Okay? UN reports have accused Saudi Arabia of possible war crimes. I would delete the possible from there. Um, the, the, the war effort is actually costing billions and billions of dollars to both the Saudis and the Emiratis. So it's actually co questionable whether it's not only um, you know, sustainable from a, 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 um, a strategic point of view and humanitarian point of view, but also from a financial point of view uh, for the Saudis and the Emiratis who also, despite having a lot of um, oil money and gas money, are going through, have been going through economic difficulties of their own. Okay. And the, what makes this a global tragedy or a global atrocity is the fact that the Saudi war effort is being supported militarily by the United States. The US has been supplying the, the, the arms, the, the, the fighter jets, and helping fuel uh, Saudi and UAE fighter jets in the air in between their bombing sessions. So the U.S. government is also potentially implicated, I would believe potentially, in the uh, criminal uh, sort of campaign that is being waged on uh, the Yemeni population. That's cool. Why is all of this happening? I'll get to that. But just to give you a sense of uh, the territorial controls and the complexity of the situation, um, again, you'll see this, the, 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 the familiar uh, division of Northwest and the rest of the country. Northwest is where the capital Sana'a is uh, located and um, the uh, Red Sea coast going down to the south but not reaching at the Gulf of Aden is controlled by the Houthis. Their actual uh, uh, base of four, the, the, their, their strength uh, base is actually in the north of the country on the border with Saudi Arabia. That city in the north is called Sada, is where you know, it's, it's, it's considered the cultural and, and, and uh, historical heartland of the, 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 the Shias. The green parts are controlled by um, the Hadi government, the Sunni Saudi-backed Hadi government. There are also pockets that, um, where neither of the forces uh, are in control. Um, the Al-Qaeda derivative, it's called Al-Qaeda in Arabian Peninsula, AKAP, has pockets where it's in control, and even ISIS, after 2016, started having its own little uh, zones of control, no longer does, but, so this is the picture as we have, okay? Now, there are three dimensions to this conflict. There's the local dimension, there's the regional dimension, and there's the international dimension. What you will hear, the, the, the sort of narratives that you will hear, will be based on the regional and the international dimensions. The local dimension gets the least amount of scrutiny, the least amount of um, sort of exposure, I would say, in the international uh, uh, press. Part of the reason is that the locals have less of a voice, less of a power to make their case, and because also it's a complicated case, um, international audiences go for easier snippets of explanation. What could be? What could be happening here? So there are two ways of thinking about the local conflict. Okay, you could think about it as an essentially sectarian crisis. That the you know the, the Shias on one side and the Sunnis on the other side, these two irreconcilable um, branches of Islam, are at it again. They've been fighting for millennia, and yet another fight a fight, a fight is happening. So that explains it. That is. The um, explanation, if not so overtly, you would hear in a lot of, at least the undertones of the explanations you would hear in a lot of analyses of the Yemeni war. But there is actually a, a prevailing factor here that is often disregarded. It is the fact that the, at the bottom of the protests, at the bottom of 
the discontent and political unrest lies very basic, very universal demands for political reform, for end of corruption, for basic rights to different groups within Yemen, which in a sense, which were uh, reflected in the massive protests in 2011, some of the biggest demonstrations I've seen, at least in pictures, took place in Yemen, and they got, if you, if you type Yemen, Arab Spring protest, you'll be amazed by the size of the crowds, but I, I mean, I would doubt that you've, you've actually come across these pictures in the international press, okay? Um, and these were, to begin with, some of the core concerns of um, the majority of the population from, you know, after at least 1990, the unification of uh, the two Yemenis. But this is often put aside, and we focus on the sectarian conflict. As I said, the sectarian exp explanation is a neat explanation. It says, okay, there are the Shias, the Zaydis, and there are the Sunnis, they're, they're the Shafis. These are denominations within these sects. The idea is that the, Sh the Shia have always been close to Iran, and been backed by Iran, because Iran is the big Shia player out there, right? And is trying to expand its influence by uh, strengthening its uh, a sort of a sort of a relationship of proxy with different Shia groups. It is doing that in Lebanon with Hezbollah, with uh, Shia militias in Iraq and Syria, and the idea is that the same is happening in Yemen. This is actually not true. This overlooks the fact that the Zaydis, even though they are technically Shia, are, have significant religious differences in terms of Shia uh, uh, theology um, between the type of Shiism that is practiced in Iran, that's called the Twelver Shiism, and their own Shia practices. In fact, this group could be said to be the closest to the Sunni uh, 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 practices of all the Shia denominations. And importantly, they didn't have a history of sectarian violence. So this is very important. Let me underline that again. Our idea is that, or the idea that we often get from the press, from international analyses, is that it's a sectarian war. You know, the division of Islam goes back to its first century, 9th century AD. You know, it's a sort of like ideological and uh, essentialist struggle, and that explains this thing. Not only is that a sort of retrospective sort of reconstruction of history, because Shias and Sunnis didn't always fight, and I, I say this in class often, the history of Shias and Sunnis is much less bloody than the history of Protestants and the Catholics. But in fact, even more so in the case of Yemen, this type of sectarian division did not really factor into political uh, uh, rivalries, okay? So there's more into that. But why, then, is there this rhetoric? This is a, um, I'll put it in simple terms, and uh, um, a straightforward, in a straightforward way, it's a propaganda tactic, more or less. It's a propaganda tactic that has been used, first, and first to begin with, by Yemeni governments um, facing the Houthi insurgency in the 2000s, and after that by the Saudi governments and their allies, in order to make, to basically cancel out, to, to overlook uh, very justifiable universal demands of the Yemeni people, and make it a more sort of, you know, uh, easily categorizable sectarian conflict. Someone who's written, uh, 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 analyzes in words that, uh, that are much better than I'm putting it right now, um, in an article called How the Houthis Became Shia at the Middle East Report in 2018. There's a link to that, I, will, I could share this with you, or you can actually type, type that title and you will see it, has, has, has put in the following words. The, this framing, this framing of the conflict as a sectarian conflict, helps Saudis and other Sunni identified regimes to channel popular discontent into resentment of Shia Iran. It finds eager supporters in the United States and other Western governments that have also been hostile to the Islamic Republic. 
and it can go over well with global media audiences who have been conditioned in the aftermath of the 2003 Iraq war to see nearly every Middle Eastern uh, counterattempts as a manifestation of intractable centuries-old struggle between the two main branches of Islam. It works, it serves the political and geopolitical interests of um, Yemeni governments trying to uh, suppress uprisings, and it also works to expand, uh, uh, serve the interests of Saudi governments. And there is the regional dimension that comes into play. Saudi Arabia is the big brother of the Arabian Peninsula. Okay? It has several foreign policy goals, which a few weeks ago I was talking in class, that involves a sort of, that is a pragmatic sort of, uh, uh, that, that becomes more intense at the very core and sort of gradually becomes more and more pragmatic on the outside. At home, the Saudis want to establish and maintain a strict domination of the homeland within its borders. Within the peninsula, the Saudis are interested in maintaining a hegemon. In other words, they don't want to conquer these other uh, countries, other monarchies, but they want to make sure that the leadership in these um, uh, uh, countries, uh, um, kingdoms, monarchies, etc., or republics, are following the lines of the Saudi regime. Regionally, they're interested in make, making sure that no single um, rival comes up and becomes too short in the middle, too, too powerful in the Middle East. In the 1960s, this was Egypt. After 1979 Islamic Revolution, it became Iran. So the whole idea is to create a balance of powers to make sure that these you know, regional um, upstarts don't uh, uh, shake the Saudi balance of Saudi hegemony in the peninsula. And globally, it has the interest of maintaining a very strategic relationship it has established with the United States in the 1940s, and that is a strategic sort of bargain for oil for military support relationship. The United States and Saudi Arabia have enjoyed a very sort of close relationship throughout the Cold War and afterwards, and, it, and, and more than anyone, Saudis want to maintain this. So it works. First of all, the Yemen crisis, having a political instability and perhaps a popular movement in Yemen, um, jeopardizes, threatens Saudi's not only peninsular, but also domestic interests. They may lose control of a proxy or, or a, 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 a neighbor, um, so it's no longer within the zone of Saudi hegemony, but not only that, if the Arab Spring type of revolution succeed in the peninsula, it also cr creates a, a, a major uh, regime crisis, regime threat for the Saudi monarchy, which is an absolutist monarchy. So what they did, for instance, in Bahrain, was to, again, portray this as a purely sectarian crisis and suppress it militarily, and similar thing in Yemen. Okay? So the idea is to sell it as a regional crisis. Let's ask at the moment the question, what about Iranian involvement? We haven't spoken about that. Have they not been involved at all? This is not the case. However, there is little evidence that uh, Iran has been involved in the Yemeni uh, crisis from the beginning. There is little evidence that they ever supplied weapons. They do that in Lebanon, they do that in Syria and Iraq. In, in, in Yemen, there is very little evidence of this thing. There is little evidence of the Houthi or you know, the Shia um, uh, demand to be under the umbrella of Iranian sort of power. Um. However, as the sectarian regional competition or the regional rivalry between Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates on one side and Iran is heating up, Iran is also starting to step up its presence in Yemen. So this rhetoric is becoming something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay? So at the moment, there's probably more Iranian influence in Yemen than there ever was, including in the beginning of the conflict. Okay? Ah, sorry, let's go back one thing. So, as I said, while the Yemeni crisis threatens Saudi interests, it also presents an opportunity for a new ambitious crown prince 
who became actually defense minister in 2015 and became the architect of the Yemen war, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, whom you might be hearing in the news, um, who has thrown away the caution and pragmatism of uh, previous Saudi rulers, who would probably not get into a quagmire, a, a humanitarian sort of uh, bloodbath, as, as is happening right now. He wanted to prove to the world that Saudi Arabia is no longer a passive player and will actually become, uh, will aggressively uh, 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 control the dynamics on the ground with military power. The same thing is happening in the United Arab Emirates. So there's a um, leadership factor involved here as well. A new generation of ambitious um, uh, sort of dreamers of, uh, who, who see themselves in the giant's mirror and trying to uh, control the dynamics. So this is also part of it. And why is the international community, if there is ever one, let's say the United States and the West, has been turning a, not only turning a blind eye to this, but actually supporting this uh, bloodbath for such a long time? Well, first of all, the propaganda works. The Yemeni conflict is imagined, understood, whether for you know, uh, um, um, honest purposes, naivete, or etc., lack of American understanding of a complex region, or for practical, uh, pragmatic reasons, as first and foremost a sectarian conflict. The United States also shares, especially the Republican wing, this fear of Iranian expansionism, and that falls neatly into that. There is also the idea of not allowing Al Qaeda uh, take root or ISIS take root in Yemen. Of course, um, ironically, the ideology that has given rise to Al Qaeda and ISIS is Wahhabism, that is the official ideology of uh, Saudi Arabia. So there, you know, the, the, the ironies are abounding. We could say that for a long time, because of these reasons, the, the damage and the casualties in the Yemen war were underreported. Up until 2018, people would talk about, you would have newspaper articles talking about massive damage in Yemen, 5,000 people, 10,000 people dead. At the same time in Syria, we were talking about hundreds of thousands of people affected or, uh, or, or killed, so it looked like a side conflict. All of a sudden, in 2018, um, mainstream media started understanding that this wasn't actually the case, and they overnight almost um, uh, 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 started uh, 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 reporting estimates five times, six times the original numbers. And all of a sudden, this started attracting attention. Um, but then, beyond the media and popular attention, there, there are the core uh, dynamics of uh, uh, um, US relationship with Gulf monarchies. As I mentioned, this long extending tie between the United States and the Saudis based on oil for um, military support, which has been sh changing in the last decades as the United States has, be has been becoming less and less dependent on foreign oil exports, but nonetheless, it's still there, and the Saudis and the UAE, the, uh, the Emiratis, have been um, uh, increasing their lobbying uh, uh, efforts to maintain this um, this, this relationship, and one of the ways that they're doing this with is a always putting the Iran, Iran factor as the number one thing on the agenda, and number two, or maybe number one, uh, uh, maybe the number one thing here, becoming a very sort of generous consumer of uh, of American arms. And while um, the U.S. involvement with Saudi war effort in Yemen has been drawing more and more popular sort of uh, heat and criticism with the election of Donald Trump. The possibility of a change in policy has sort of gone out the window. One of the first things that Donald Trump did was to uh, uh, sign a massive arms sales agreement with Saudi Arabia at the figure of 12 billion US dollars. And Trump says these are our main uh, co co uh, customers and friends, and we will overlook anything that they do, which may not be looking very good. He doesn't care to begin with anyway. The thing is, this wasn't getting any attention until, so we're talking about the death of about 60,000 people, the Yemenis, 85,000 starving children, did not necessarily um, have the power to swing opinions in the United States until, bless you, one journalist, 
one Saudi journalist who was working for Washington Post, who became a critic of the regime, Saudi regime, was brutally murdered by the Saudi government in the embassy, in the consulate, uh, Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Jamal Khashoggi, I'm sure you've heard of the, the news. It became a massive sort of scandal. All of a sudden people awoke to what, what kind of a regime Saudi Arabia is. Inter interestingly, that drew um, a lot of uh, attention to also the inconsistency or the lack of sort of uh, uh, logic in the fact that the Yemeni atrocities could be overlooked, but uh, the killing, atrocious killing of one journalist was, was enough to sort of shift the debate on Saudi Arabia. But in a sense, this has actually helped to put the Yemeni uh, war on the agenda in the United States as well. And beginning in last year, a bipartisan uh, committee in the US Congress, um, I think the Democratic signatory was Bernie Sanders and a Republican counterpart, um, drafted a, a bill to stop US arming of the Saudis in their war in Yemen. And this passed the US Congress. But recently, in the bill was defeated in the Republican-controlled uh, Senate and was basically put, put, put aside by the Trump administration. So as far as we can see, for the foreseeable future, the United States will continue to arm um, the, the Saudi uh, 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 war machine. And even though there's been a tentative peace uh, uh, ceasefire in, in recent weeks, the end of the conflict doesn't seem to be quite inside. Okay, that was a good 20 minutes. <laughs> Let me stop there so we can continue with the uh, questions and answers. Thank you. as well, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll pretend I understand, and <laughs> hopefully I will understand. Doutor Matuta, essa guerra civil tem a ver com a vontade popular de um governo secular? Is it a conflict between secular government and... Pode, pode fazer uma pergunta em, em português, só que eu não, não entendo. Será uma demanda para ter um governo secular em vez de ser uma república islâmica? Ok. Um, we're talking about the, the possibility for the future. Right? Calma. Ele perguntou se a vontade de ter um governo secular foi uma das causas da guerra. Ok. Um, I don't think so. So, if you're talking about um, if, if you're talking about the, the two Yemens, the Yemeni uh, sort of South Yemen and North Yemen, there is evidence to suggest that in South, the imposition of not only secular but atheist um, um, socialist uh, ideology had more of a, a basically backfire in the sense that there was, it did create a backlash that put more sort of fuel to religious emphasis, religiously sort of driven militias. But in the, in the, since 1990, even though it's a republic, uh, the fact that, I mean, religious uh, allegiances have been out in the open, they're not suppressed, so I wouldn't say that the fact that there was a secular government has led to the rise of an Islamic sort of a reaction. It's more of a question of ungovernability. Um, we're talking again of um, a very poor nation with uh, the, the central government having a limited control over its entire territory. And these are uh, sort of, um, with, with the populations in these places, uh, um, um, justifiable grievances against uh, the local government against the powers that be, which creates, of course, a fertile ground for uh, uh, radical uh, groups to emerge, whether they are you know, secular or religious. And it 
it's interesting, of course, that there is actually a, 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 some sort of an overlap between the secular sort of, um, you could say, radical secular communist groups that emerged in south of Sudan, in the uh, south of Yemen in um, the 1960s, and the Al Qaeda linked groups that emerged again in the same areas in uh, the 2000s and 2010s. These sort of um, groups become a vehicle in many ways in many regions for expression of, of discontent, especially in rural parts of, um, of, of countries. So it was South Yemen that was um, the sort of uh, epicenter of the Arab world's most sort of um, uh, communistic uh, government. And it also became, uh, in the 2000s, the, the, the place of uh, where in the Arabian Peninsula, Al Qaeda and linked groups uh, started flourishing. Um, you've, talk, you've talked about how the local aspect of the conflict is maybe one of the most under and overlooked aspects of the Yemeni civil war. But how has the the, other, the regional and the international aspect of the war affected? Local, the local aspect of the, the civil war in recent years, in the sense that it is not like the Houthis and the, the I mean, the, both groups are now thinking about the conflict in the same way that the Western media and the international media as a whole um, approach the conflict in the sense that it's not about the local reforms and <coughs> the discontent with the dictatorship that had happened since the, the late government. Has it become, by, on the local, I don't know if you can answer it, but has it become in the local fields a conflict that is portrayed by the media here in the West? I don't, I, you're right, I don't know if I can answer that. I don't know if I have access to answer that. Uh, but what we see is that the, the, the dynamics of the conflict have evolved to reflect um, the regional sort of um, dynamics. So certainly with the fact that you know, a stronger uh, more powerful uh, regional actors are putting in uh, arms and uh, money into this conflict is redefining the terms of the conflict. It's sort of like what happened in Syria in a sense. I mean, look, it's the Syrian conflict this, what did start as a popular uprising. You know? And they still, to this day, we don't hear about it anymore too much, but there are still millions of Syrians who believed in that uprising, in, the, in those protests, um, as a sort of civic civic uprising demanding um, you know, positive change. And they, they, when you talk to them, they hate the fact that they're completely ignored in the, in, in, in the world at the moment. So in a sense, I would assume the same to be the same, especially because the Yemeni uh, protests during the Arab Spring were so powerful. And on top of that, the local, uh, okay, the local uh, dimension is... Uh, it's very convoluted, very, very complex, to the extent that I couldn't really properly explain to you, and this was my earlier dis disclaimer, I'm not really an expert, okay? I'm just following it as I'm following the general region. Um, for instance, um, Ali Abdullah Saleh was the president from 1978 and in 1990, uh, united Yemen, and the Houthi uprising was against him in the 2000s. And at the time, he was backed by Saudi Arabia. In 2011, the popular uprising, not just backed by the Houthis, the, the, the Shia, the popular uprising pushes him out of power. The Saudi Arabia, Saudis basically let him go um, and install another sort of puppet kind of guy. Okay? What happens is that afterwards, Saleh becomes an ally of the Houthis. So it's Saleh's forces forces loyal to Saleh that have been supporting, first and foremost, the Houthi. Uh, uh, armed um, struggle, armed offensive. More than you know, there is much more evidence of that than any Iranian, you know, mili uh, military support. Um, but on both sides, there are significant uh, uh, divisions as well. So, um, not long time ago, there were clashes between Saudi-backed uh, Hadi government's forces and UAE-backed forces in. Yemen, at the same time, after the capture of uh, Sana'a, um, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh and the Houthis fell apart, 
and Saleh was actually killed by Houthis. Recently assassinated by the Houthis. This, to be honest, baffles uh, my understanding. If there's anyone who knows the dynamics better, I would be willing to, uh, uh, to, to discuss further as well. So the I mean, local dynamics are, are, are still there, very strong, very powerful, but the local players are very much making use of uh, the regional uh, uh, dynamics as well, because you, know, you need arms and you need money and uh, whoever is affording, uh, uh, supporting. Even, even having said that, uh, the, let me again underline the fact that Iranian involvement has been limited until sure how to answer that question, but I, I would say that it's both of these things. First of all, the U.S. existence in the security, because I'm not aware of the extent to which this was uh, discussed to get, get, get to the Security Council. If, I think in the back here, um, yes, I'm, I'm going to say something, because it, it looks like you have... Okay. Um, if, if, you, if you know more about this than me, please, please uh, join in. But it's the A, U.S. involvement, um, I mean, that has uh, disqualified the possibility of an international sort of um, reaction to the Yemen crisis, and and the fact that the other great powers were not interested. Great powers. Um, Russians didn't have a stake in Yemen. The Chinese didn't necessarily have a stake, and this has been sort of under the radar. Of sorts. Um, also, I mean the the level of influence the Saudis have on the international scale um, to sort of influence, and the, and the Emiratis actually. Sometimes it's said the Emirati uh, uh, crown prince, who's known by his initials as well, MBZ, MBZ, is more influential than the, the Saudi crown, crown, crown prince. Anyway, the level of lobbying power these uh, governments have on the, the, the US um, part, portions of the U.S. government, and also on um, the U.K. government, have been quite significant. I mean, in 2013, I think it emerged uh, a sort of backroom deal between the U.S., U.K., and Saudi Arabia to put Saudi Arabia on the United Nations Human Rights Council in exchange for um, arms deals. And uh, so it's actually quite... Um, and, and that also blocks, of course, international uh, efforts to put this issue more at the top of uh, the agenda. Uh, I would like to know if you could talk about uh, the Israeli involvement in the war, if there is one. Because here in Brazil, we, we had uh, uh, uprising in arms sales to Saudi Arabia since the beginning of the Yemen war. And now with the new government, we have a sort of anti-Arab Islamic narrative and speech, and a pro-Israeli speech. And how could this affect the regional, the, the global factors? How the Brazilian government's uh, position could change, affect the regional factors? Or? Yes, and the Israeli mostly. Okay, so two, two, two different uh, questions, I guess. Um, I, I can't say too much about Israeli specific involvement in Yemen, but I can say the nature of uh, Israeli-Saudi relationship and Israeli-UAE relationship. So Israel um, is only recognized by two Arab countries, um, formally, uh, Jordan and Egypt. Okay, there are two treaties that um, in 1978 and 1994 that uh, allow these two countries to officially recognize um, uh, Israel. 
But arguably, the closest <laughs> sort of strategic relations these days of the Israelis are with the Gulf monarchies, even though they're not recognized by these Gulf monarchies. Um, and it's basically the sort of uh, priorities of the governments in place in these, uh, uh, in these, in these countries. The right-wing Netanyahu government in Israel, and uh, uh, these sort of assortment of crown princes in uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia, and um, centered around mainly uh, the issue of Iranian threat. So Israeli-Saudi uh, collaboration under the radar it has been growing. Okay, it's under the radar mostly for the Saudis because it's still not fully okay to do business with the Israelis because there's still the Palestinian cause. Um, it's still not a popular, you know, Israel is still the most hated uh, country for, for Muslims, for um, not only for the Palestinian cause, but also for anti-Semitic reasons. Um, but for Israel, of course, it's more of a, they, they make less of a secret of this engagement to show that, you know, um, they have wider sort of uh, contacts in the region. So, and that involves strategic um, uh, cooperation, military cooperation, not open military cooperation, but you know, exchange of intelligence, etc., and putting similar sort of lobbying efforts on United States governments vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And if we consider that within, you know, if you put Yemen in that sort of picture, that would have an impact on Yemen as well, even though I couldn't really say to you how the Israeli government has been dealing with the Yemeni conflict. Um, I think the Brazilian case will have, effect, have more effect on Brazil than on uh, the regional dynamics. Um, and I'm not sure how sustainable it is, mainly for economic trade reasons. And I think there's already significant pushback from certain interest groups in Brazil, especially the, uh, the, the meatpacking uh, industry, the agribusiness industry, whose number one uh, clients, cons uh, cons consumers, importers, are Arab countries of halal meat, of uh, this idea that you know uh, uh, the Brazilian government should throw away its relationship with these countries and um, you know, follow Trump's lead on moving the embassy, uh, Brazilian embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, etc. And we already see that this is not happening. I mean, Bolsonaro has backed away from a number of these uh, claims. So um, I'm not sure to the extent of um, impact uh, on, on, on the region as long as uh, uh, Bolsonaro doesn't fulfill these um, uh, campaign promises. If he does fulfill these campaign promises, of course it's, it's significant because Brazil has been under the uh, Labour governments a sort of you know, a, a, a supporter of uh, um, a number of Arab causes, a number of Arab regimes, etc. I have a question. So, um, well, basically the, the narrative that we see, the, the picture that's being painted is that the United States and um, the, UA, uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia and Israel, they're all against Yemen, but we don't really see many allies of the Houthis, um, maybe Iran, but not exactly. And that's kind of like, it's kind of scary, isn't it? I mean, we don't really see an end to this conflict where, you know, money's being made, weapons are being sold. Um, do you see any prospects in the future of, you know, a change in these dynamics or something that could, you know, eventually, you know, bring an end to the war? Um, I think, I mean, so the, the clear picture is that the, the, the Saudi sort of juggernauts the Saudi offensive to you know, um, um, drop bombs on no matter where in Yemen to retake uh, Sana'a, bring push back the Houthis and install whoever they want in government has failed. So, and and there is a sort of mili strategic military aspect to this. Um, in any warfare, in any conflict, air air support, air aerial uh, offensive is is very strategically important. It can shift balances, but without land superiority, you can't really protect, you can't really change the dynamics um, in the long term. And the Saudis are actually lacking, and their, 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 their um, allies are lacking this type of decisive uh, 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 force on the ground. 
on this, in this sense, um, the Houthi uh, militia and their effort has been pretty sturdy, pretty powerful, have been holding on to territories. But, I mean, the, 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 with the effect that the cost on the entire population is, um, is extremely dramatic. So, I think the only realization and the only way to end the conflict would be a realization on the ground by local actors to begin with, and on these three dimensions, by regional actors and international actors to, um, to understand that the current path is unsustainable. I think there are signs of this. Um, there are signs that, you know, obviously Americans are uh, increasingly uncomfortable with supporting uh, uh, the campaigns, the Saudi campaigns, even though they're going to continue. It seems uh, there are signs that within Saudi Arabia, um, uh, 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 um, different groups within the regime are seeing uh, the Mohammed bin Salman's sort of adventurism as harmful on the Saudi, uh, you know, regime security in the long run, both in, t in territorial terms and also in financial terms, and on the ground, the Houthis are having a tough time holding on, they're holding on, but, you know, at, up to a certain point, everybody's been suffering. So, the best hope would be that there's a threshold that is reached where all these <coughs> actors come to a realization that uh, there needs to be a change in, uh, in the path, and perhaps a recent, as I said, ceasefire that was um, agreed upon uh, a couple of weeks ago, just a ceasefire, not a truce, can lead to some sort of a, a settlement. It probably can lead, they probably can have settlements in the sort of, when we look at the recent history of Yemen, we see you know, periods of conflict being sort of stopped by some sort of a unity, a government agreement, power sharing, that doesn't necessarily last for very long. So that is a possible way forward as well, we'll see. The question of course is, um, I mean the big question here is, how a sort of popular uprising as happened in 2011, has um, involved regional actors to turn into such a humanitarian catastrophe. And I think, you know, we, even though, even if there is a ceasefire at the end, the damage is so extensive that uh, we have to also think about this, uh, this dynamic that has also happened in Bahrain, that has also happened in Syria, and uh, so the um, status quo, uh, the post, uh, the status quo ante will look much sort of better than what has remained in the end. Mm -hmm. And we'll see what, what kind of like a civil society or um, popular sort of will there will be for um, uh, energy there will be for uh, uh, wanting to build a, a better uh, Yemeni government. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Começando a pesquisa ainda, mas estamos, estamos caminhando. Nessa questão um pouco mais local, eu venho trabalhando com uma leitura um pouco mais sociológica do conflito, no sentido de uma disputa, é, primeiramente, doméstica entre elites. Entre elites, sim. Exatamente. E uma ligação dessas elites com algumas outras elites regionais, por exemplo, da Arábia Saudita. Então, é mais ou menos o que eu venho trabalhando. É, e, e nesse aspecto, eu acho que isso mostra algumas coisas que às vezes a gente, em relações internacionais, a gente costuma passar despercebido. Porque a gente pensa muito em um Estado fechado, então na Arábia Saudita, ou no governo do Iêmen, e a gente acaba perdendo a perspectiva de alguns atores ali envolvidos no dia a dia, no cotidiano do, do conflito. Então, é, pela pequena pesquisa que eu comecei a fazer, o Salé, por exemplo, conseguiu governar ao longo de 33 anos, como você contou, baseado numa rede clientelista muito forte. Né? Então, da maneira que eu vejo, assim, ele começou a perder apoios importantes. Então, é, por exemplo, uma, uma pessoa muito forte do braço das Forças Armadas, que era um, um aliado de longa data, que quando começou a vir, como você disse, os 
protestos super grandes né, na primavera árabe, meio que rompe com o governo e hoje em dia ele consegue ser o vice-presidente do Iêmen. Então dá para ver que existiu um rearranjo ali de algumas forças internas. Né? Eu estou conectando isso um pouco com o regional e o internacional, mas enfim, acho que só queria acrescentar um pouco. Thank you, and I think it's very, it's a very important point. Um, of course, um, these elite disputes and coalitions are not just, you know, in an isolated chamber. As you said, they have regional connections, but they also have uh, local popular connections as well. Um, who did these elite groups uh, have as their base? If it's the military, of course, it's the institution of the military. But if we're talking about tribal groups, which play segments of society. I could compare. The example of Yemen, uh, or contrast it with Syria, for instance, where also elite factions and elite coalitions have been very important, not acting in the opposite way. Uh, unlike Ali Abdullah Saleh, who lost very critical control or, or support during the protests, the reason why uh, Bashar al-Assad managed to stay in power was because he managed to enjoy, sustain the support and loyalty of key socio-economic and institutional allies that allowed him to uh, rule for decades as well. We're talking about um, the military, of course, and that shows the success of the uh, Al-Assad clan and in putting sort of strategic clan members, the Alawite members, into uh, strategic positions, uh, but also creating sort of a good patronage network uh, beyond just identity. At the same time, on a social level, we should also for not forget that unlike in the case of Yemen, um, the sort of state-backed bourgeoisie of the Syrian population based in Damascus never really rose up against, against Assad. They never really went to the street like the um, the, the more urban, urbanite uh, Yemenis went to the street against As uh, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, they never went against Assad. So in that sense, Assad was successful, I mean, if you can consider the, the horrible sort of mess as a success, nonetheless he, he survived because he was able to maintain these um, social political alliances which, um, whether Gaddafi in Libya or um, uh, who had actually, you know, basically completely personalized his, his rule, or the very sort of complex network in Yemen didn't uh, uh, manage to, uh, to see. So, yeah, the elite sort of coalitions is probably uh, the, one of the key aspects to explain all the, all, all, all the changes and uh, ups and downs of the conflict. I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's. I'm sure. I'm sure there's. I mean, first of all, let's explain what cut yeah, is. Uh, can you? About it, about it today. You heard about I'm it. Today. Aware of it. Oh, okay. I just read it um, a little bit before the election here. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, I have rudimentary knowledge of, 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 of the situation, but I know that it's a it's a massive um, social uh, phenomenon issue. Cut is a is a plant based drug, let's say, kind of like a, in between uh, cannabis and tobacco that is chewed and has a sort of a sedative effect. It is produced on a massive level in Yemen and Yemenis are notorious for chewing this um, uh, product and consuming it in vast numbers. So, you know, one of the sort of stereotypes, not even a stereotype actually, a sort of cliches about Yemeni cities is that the floor is full of green stuff, green sort of like um, uh, tobacco-like product, which is cut that uh, majority of the population, adult male population at least, chews and then spits on the floor, on the ground. Uh, one of the sort of assumptions during the Arab Spring's very early days was, or these questions was, look, the Yemenis are so sedated because of 
uh, you know, chewing this cut, that they probably won't be, you know, interested in that and getting an uprising. But they actually, you know, turned the country into one of the hottest sort of locals of uh, of, of of the Arab Spring revolutions. Um, I don't really know the social, the, the economic aspect of it, the production and uh, who controls it and what that would mean in terms of political uh, uh, power. Um, if you do, do please. Uh, 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 um, but I'll be interested to find out as well. This is something that is uh, an interesting, for sure, an interesting aspect, social cultural aspect of uh, Yemen. Saudi-led government is no longer uh, in charge. It's been pushed out of Sana'a, the capital. So the government, if we're talking about that government, it's it's sort of uh, in exile of sorts, in dom domestic exile, and they don't have a humanitarian case to make. They're being backed by the Saudis. The Houthis are trying to make this case, but they have uh, uh, their sort of outlets to international um, uh, media or international legal forums is much much more limited because they're also seen as allied with Iran. So the entire narrative um, is very much very difficult for them to surmount um, and to, to sort of like make a case for themselves. They're not recognized as a government by a lot of the countries, so they don't really have a seat to make this case on behalf of the Yemeni population. It's a matter of uh, a lack of voice and lack of uh, international representation. Instead of aligning with uh, the Saudi government, they were aligned with the Saudi government from the from the beginning. The the, 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 the president Hadi was planted by the Saudis. After, in a sense, after the uh, the the Arab Spring revolutions, the Arab Spring uprising, um, Ali Abdullah Saleh, the support for Saleh was cut off by the Saudis. He was let go as a sort of like a concession to the protesters. And the new government involves also the blessing of the Saudis, but that didn't change anything. So the new government was sort of, you know, a creation of sorts, of Saudi machination, of Saudi engineering. It would have been, it would have been interesting had they sort of uh, went against their um, financiers, but we don't really see that too much. Okay. We all know much more about Yemen now. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> so, shall we? Today or shall we? What do you think? Are there more questions? back to my podcast and readings and sort of uh, select a few for you and uh, share with you. So, you have any? Books, books, texts. I have some, sure. Okay, um, can I email? Yes, you have my email. Yes. <laughs> I'd be happy to, anyone who's interested in some, some, some reading that I've, I've been doing um, recently, and not just for this presentation, for, for some time, I'd be happy to share them. Okay? Thank you very much again for uh, for your interest. Um, and thank you so much for coming. It's really very interesting. I think I can speak for everyone. Uh, hopefully. Thank you. No, seriously. <laughs> now we are going to talk about.
women's and LGBT struggles in the Middle East for three hours. <laughs> <laughs>